Okay, so um, welcome to the last uh, talk in this session today. Um, it's by one of our sponsors, Deepfield, um, and I present to you Stefan Meinders. Thank you. Yeah, so um, my name is Stefan Meinders, as introduced. Um, I'm working for a company called Deepfield, and um, basically our goal is to monitor yeah, today's complex networks in, in complex environments to, um, let's say, for example, to um, take care of quality of exp um, experience in ISP networks. So one of these topics is for, for us is now from peak time to prime time availability. What does this basically mean? Um, if we think about how our traffic profile looked a couple of years ago, it was more something like a, a sinus curve, right? Every, every time the same. And today, if we look into incoming traffic into ISP eyeball carriers, it, it looks like it goes up and then it goes up again. Right, so it goes up again and then down, and this new up again um, is something like yeah on top of this sinus curve, which is our prime time, um, yeah our, our consumers, our subscribers consuming over the top services, mainly at prime time hours, and ISPs, network operators are, um, yeah they need to build their networks for this prime time peak, right, to support best quality of experience, even if there's a lot of traffic on these networks, and most of this traffic is, of course, videos these days. How to make sure that in large complex networks, the video is delivered in good quality to all of our subscribers? That's the idea, without yeah, um, having to deploy, for example, DPI everywhere in the network that wouldn't scale, um, and that would be quite expensive, I guess. Um, so we have a different approach to do that. First of all, how to measure quality of experience without the usage of DPI. Um, the industry already defined a measure for it or defined the method how to measure quality, video quality. Um, one company doing that is Netflix, for example, and Netflix publishes um, their results um, it's called yeah the Netflix ISP speed uh, or I, you know, speed index or ISP ranking. Um, YouTube does that as well. Currently not in Germany but in many other regions around the world. It's called Video Quality Report. Um, another initiative to yeah share um, video streaming quality is driven by um, Cable Labs. Cable Labs is based mainly based on um, deep field technology um, to measure quality of experience and to compare different ISPs, in this case cable operators, um, against each other. So sometimes, or you may want to know, okay, why is my Netflix ranking um, better than others or not so good that, uh, as my main competitor, for example? <clears throat> so you want to understand, yeah, why do I get this kind of ranking? Um, where in, am I really bad in particular regions? So on average, um, your video quality could be good or bad or whatever. Um, but um, for a particular re uh, region, um, city, it could be yeah, in particular bad. So how to figure this out? Um, the first idea then could be, okay, why does it matter at all? So if there is not enough capacity available for over-the-top services at prime time, um, they will just stop working, right? Um, a video that's delivered too slow is stopping. Um, it, it might work, it might get into buffering phases, but your subscribers, users are not going to, to watch this video any longer. They s just stop using it. So streaming has some kind of soft real-time requirements. Mm -hmm. Networks and the over-the-top um, traffic delivery techniques are more complex than before. So there are many different ways how traffic is um, routed into your networks, um, different network architectures and so on. So the questions are, do I have caches? Are these caches on net? Are these caches at ISPs or at transits? Is the traffic coming from a cache or is it directly coming from um, the content owner um, or a CDN? Um, <clears throat> sorry, um, operated by this content owner. Um, yeah, 
that are the main questions. Um, to Today's tools we have to monitor um, large ISP networks um, very often are not providing sufficient information to maintain these yeah, key performance indicators for video quality over time network-wide. Sometimes you have something like 5% coverage um, with DPI. Um, yeah, that only works for your 5%, but the problem might be in a region where your, your DPI is not um, covering uh, that region. Video quality could mean very different things. So you need to understand, is 1.5 megabits per second for a particular service good or bad? Um, and it, there's really a, a huge yeah, difference between these different services. Netflix, for example, delivers an HD stream on average with something like 3.7 3 megabits per second just fine. Um, Voodoo, for example, uh, delivers SD streams as well, but uses nearly 10 megabits to do that. So it's yeah different kind of codecs, different kind of um, yeah encoding of these um, streams, and um, yeah some are more efficient, others are less efficient. Um, so you need to know what is good for a particular service and um, what is bad. Um, the next um, idea, if you get to a point where you could monitor it, where you understand how to monitor it and what is good and what is bad, is to quantify if there is. A problem in the network, what is exactly the impact? So you may want to know how many concurrent streams do you have in your network um, via a particular router, via a particular peer, um, to a, a region um, or to via a CMTS, for example. Um, this is from one of our customers where we monitor the CMTS and um, we see that there have been yeah, 760 concurrent streams, number of streams via this CMTS. And what happened then is that there was some unplanned maintenance and um, yeah, this box has to be, had to be restarted. And what they were now able to see is what really was the impact to customers. The impact to customers is that this on a 50-inch you know, screen in their living rooms very prominently shows in, in, in the homes of these nearly 800 customers that this ISP's internet is not working anymore. Right? It's not just a laptop which has no internet connectivity anymore, it's the big screen that doesn't work anymore. And that was the case for 760 customers in this case. Another thing that's remarkable here is that this CMTS was back in service after something like 20 to 30 minutes, is what our customer told us. The customers didn't come back for something like four hours. So there are different ideas why it took so long for customers to come back and use this service again. Um, maybe they went to bed. <laughs> that would be quite good. I think that all these customers continued watching their TV series and movies and so on on their mobile devices. If you have a similar product or similar visibility into mobile traffic, you should see the number of streams going up at the same moment in time here as well. Um, this is um, important to know for customers who run um, hybrid um, access technologies to their subscribers, um, where the, you use a combination of DSL lines and uh, LTE, for example. So if one of these lines fails where the stream goes um, or passes by, it switches to the other technology. Um, and then you can monitor the quality for that stream as well. So, yeah, that's quite interesting data to understand what happens in the network. Is this a good time to do maintenance on this box? No, it isn't because I have 800 streams in this part of my network. I cannot do any maintenance now. I need to find the correct time to do that, for example. Um, so that's one point, how traffic is and in which quality traffic might be delivered to your customers, but how is this, this content delivered into your network? That has been changed dramatically during the past 10 years is the time frame here in between. Um, at the beginning, 2005, we had um, a lot of different technologies how to carry content into um, ISP networks. And today, nearly all the high vol uh, volume and value content where customers pay for is delivered via CDN networks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, transit I IXPs um, are 
um, the, the amount of traffic via IXPs is increasing. Again, that's yeah, due to how to connect ISP networks to CDN networks. Um, very often, IXPs start to play a very significant role. Um, we have seen this yesterday in the opening talk, right, where the uh, D6 um, offered methods to connect to different cloud services, and the same applies for CDN services. Um, and we have new interconnections. So, um, Connections um, or CDN operators, content providers, don't only um, place their caching uh, caches and systems in the largest city um, per country or per region. Now they start to do it in the second largest city as well. So the content is more and more distributed to the network edges as close to yeah to the customers, to the subscribers as possible. And we see yeah, less traffic um, via traditional transit. Um, other um, observations um, for CDNs is that the number of CDNs is increasing over time, that's for sure. And um, that there is a need to monitor when these caches, these CDN caches in your network are um, filled. So in this case, we see very clearly when um, Open Connect, for example, just filled this cache. This is a screenshot from a customer in America, but um, on UTC time. So this is why it looks like uh, between 7 and 10 o'clock in the morning. So another point is how is this traffic actually transported to your customers. Um, one other problem why DPI doesn't really work so well anymore is that nearly everything is now, first of all, encrypted uh, and transported via HTTP slash HTTPS. Um, so if you want to monitor the entire network with something like NetFlow SFlow technology, the only information you get is it, yes, it was on port 80 or on port 443. Um, but you need to be able to look deeper into it because you want to understand how much of this over-the-top traffic do I actually have. It's no longer enough to know, okay, this traffic comes from Akamai, for example. Akamai has many different types of traffic categories. It's video, web, downloads, and so on. Um, <clears throat> And if you want to filter out only video traffic on this link, you need to have a deeper understanding of what's going on there. So it's no longer enough to just know the traffic distribution via ports. And you couldn't really do DPI because it doesn't help on encrypted services. And it's quite expensive to put DPI everywhere just to monitor video traffic. Um, so encrypted versus unencrypted traffic. So how much uh, encrypted traffic do we actually have? This is really a problem already. Um, this is um, a comparison for Netflix traffic um, we made. So we see that there is web traffic, um, which is the blue lines. Um, and there are two measures. Um, on the left-hand side, there is the number of streams. The number of streams is this curve here. So it goes up and down. And this is the average bit rate per stream. It's you know, 3.7, roughly, megabits per second. So this is constant, which is good, right? So if this average bitrate per stream would go down. When the number of concurrent streams goes up, then you know, okay, there is something like a bandwidth problem, utilization problem somewhere. But this is a nice yeah, flat line. That's good. Um, you could have many customers or less customers watching Netflix streams. The quality is always the same. But the quality, so megabits per second, is higher for unencrypted traffic. Blue is web. Port 80. 443 is this um, yeah, orange, yellow orange lines, um, which shows okay, everything that's transported encrypted has a lower average bitrate per stream. So it's only 1.5 megabits per second. That means Netflix is at the moment encrypting only SD streams. If you watch SD streams, you get this encrypted. If you watch HD streams, you are very likely get unencrypted streams. <clears throat> But that's going to change as soon as it's more efficient to, um, or more powerful to, to encrypt um, higher um, amounts of bandwidth, then um, they will change that as well. Mm, yeah, so quality of experience reporting um, um, is a, possible for different kinds of services, um, and it's possible to compare a number of um, concurrent streams with um, average bitrate per stream, for example. 
Yeah, this is another example for Netflix traffic. So this is many services. The list, yeah, currently shows six in this case. Um, it's already very overutilized, this graph. So if we filter just for Netflix, for example, we can see here the same graph, right? This is amount of users, and this is a quality which is more or less stable. That's good. Um, another or other interesting things to monitor um, today and to have CD, uh, visibility into CDNs and what CDNs are delivering to your networks is the move um, for Dropbox from um, a service they used before. So Dropbox was using Amazon. Um, now they are using their own AS, their own infrastructure to deliver these services. So how does this look like over time? If I don't have visibility into CDNs, into which kind of traffic on which CDNs, which services in which CDNs are delivered into my network, I couldn't build this graph, right? So I knew I can filter for a service site, Dropbox. How was Dropbox delivered in February last, last year? Um, and now this year. So at the beginning, everything was coming in on, the, on this customer's internet to connection, right? That was their connection to Amazon. That's a quite, that's Merit Networks, it's a quite cheap um, uh, peering for them, but AT&T is a paid peering, which costs them money. So Dropbox decided to move from Amazon to, into their own AS, which had an effect on this customer <clears throat> that the amount of traffic on, a on the, their AT&T peering went up, right? So you need to monitor these kind of services and you need to identify, okay, what's actually causing, or causing this and costing me money? That's the idea behind these graphs, why it's important to measure not only over-the-top services, but as well how these over-the-top services are delivered into my network. That was the best example we have been able to find because, yeah, of course, Dropbox is not an over-the-top service, but it's a good example how it, what's basically meant by this. Um, other very important things to monitor is um, that there are dependencies between different services. Sometimes for a service to run, you need um, connections to different um, other entities to be working. And a good example is um, Instagram or Netflix again. So Instagram basically is delivered via, or was delivered via Akamai. <clears throat> but you need to have the connection to Facebook working as well because it use, it's using login um, credential um, checking on on Facebook. Uh, the same applies for Netflix. Netflix is delivering only the video part on, um, on the connections from their CDN, from their streaming servers, but all these static content, catalog information and so on still ca comes from Akamai. So you need to have your connection to Akamai working probably and Netflix. So um, yeah, logic engines and um, yeah, this kind of service uh, chaining or cyber supply chain building um, is an understanding that where is a problem for a particular service, what exactly doesn't work if there are issues. Um, so there are many other use cases um, you can potentially think of if you have the capability to do these kind of analy analytics in, in your network. So just to pick one example, how much YouTube traffic over this Verizon transit link is being consumed by premium enterprise customers in Boston, could be an example. This is a quite complex query against the database because it uses what we call many different dimensions. Um, so this is something that could be a use case. Um, or did traffic delivered by um, the content server in New York City stay in New York City? Yeah. You placed or you allowed the content owner to place a cache in your network for a region, Hamburg, for example. Is this cache now servicing Munich as well? So is yeah, the CDN operator using my backbone <laughs> to send traffic to, to different regions? That could be quite expensive for you and use a lot of your backbone capacity. What you might not want to have, right? So measuring these kind of things is as well a good or a necessary thing these days. Um, other things are um, service assurance related. So how good is the service or how good uh, is yeah, the ISP in delivering a con uh, yeah, the content to the subscribers? Um, that could be done as well. So this is how does it basically work? Um, we built, we have built a 
yeah, huge, um, yeah, today we would say big data platform um, to consume data from as many data sources as, po as possible, correlate it, um, all these kind of things, and then provide the data to other systems via our APIs. So we have northbound and southbound connectors. Southbound connectors are getting generic telemetry information, flow as an MP, VGP, or um, more modern kind of things um, under the term of streaming te telemetry, protobuf, gRPC, Yang, netconf things. Um, we can consume syslog information as well. And all this is then correlated to a feed called Cloud Genome. Cloud Genome is a mapping of IP addresses to services on the internet. Um, you yeah, to, to have um, an easy way to, to think about it is um, like Google builds an index of every web page, we build an index of every IP address and the service related to it. And as soon as we see a particular flow, we map this flow to the service and say, okay, if I see a customer communicated to this IP address, we know this IP belongs to YouTube, a streaming server, we know this is a stream, and then we measure the um, yeah, bit rates and so on. So this f information comes uh, with our cloud genome feed. And all of this correlated together then provides average bit rates per stream, for example, and yeah, cloud visibility and so on. Um, our UI, we have seen some screenshots from the UI, is one of the, or uses our API to yeah, present the data. Every other system could use this data as well. Um, yeah, this is just, basically showing how it works. So everything starts with a natural record. We then add SNMP information to it um, to identify interfaces, routers, and so on. Then BGP for path information. Um, DNS flow is another way <coughs> to yeah, add or to, or to enhance flows for more regional um, sites. And then we have our cloud genome feed plus your data, so if you want to add anything else, like OSS, BSS data, radius, DHCP records, um, we can consume those data as well and build then this yeah, multi-dimensional database to do queries against it. Um, just having data in a huge data store um, doesn't really help, so you need some logic to understand how to use this data, how is this, um, are these data points related to each other, and that is what our logic engines are doing so, network logic, service mapping, and so on. We have seen some examples. I guess I need to speed up a little bit to not to destroy your coffee break. Um, so logic engines are there for performance map, um, monitoring, topology mapping, and service mapping. Um, yeah, and enable network-wide monitoring for all these kind of KPIs, um, traffic paths, and so on. Any questions? That was quick. <laughs> really? So everybody wants to go on the coffee break, or do we have questions? No one. <laughs> okay, the coffee one. Uh, thanks for the talk. Thank you. And <clears throat> have fun with the coffee break. <laughs>